Welcome to MLR Kickoff, folks. We have a big show for you today. It's going to be a San Diego Legion focus as we're welcoming their owner and uh, well, I don't know if he's the CEO, GM or all the above. Ryan Patterson will join us a little later as well. One of their stars, one of the original Legion players from 2018, Nate Augsburger, joins us. An absolute brilliant chat with him. So to make sure you don't miss that one. As always, I'm joined by the professor, Pete Steinberg, who had a very busy week. How many games was it, Pete? Three games you called on the weekend? I, I called three games, although honestly, I know we've got the San Diego guys on. And um, if we have, uh, uh, like, I, I don't know that San Diego counts as a full game. We had some technical difficulties and, and the line went down. But I had three games that I was calling. Yeah, it's funny, the, the, the critters seem to come out week one, no matter where you are or how many years that we do this. It was always uh, going to be something going wrong, but it didn't matter. It was, a, it was actually a much better second half than first half anyway. Yeah, so really that's, yeah, that's very true. The second half, and we got most of the action. And, you know, Dan, it's one of those challenges that you get when you get into a new venue, like you test it, but you just don't know what's actually going to happen. So that that was a challenge. The crew did The crew did a great job. Like, like you and I both know Reese Edwards and, uh, you know, Reese walks in and it's me and Kit McConaughey and Reese walks in, doesn't smile. And he says, guys, these are the ones that are really fun. And then he walks out like, but not smiling at all. So it's like, obviously not fun, but it was like for him, but it was good. No, it was, it was a good weekend. There was lots of good rugby and, uh, and, and probably most important for the league, some, some upsets and competitive games. I mean, I cannot sing enough praises for Reese Edwards. He's, he is such a valuable asset for Major League Rugby and rugby in the U.S. as well. However, those who don't know him, he came here with one of the most upbeat, vibrant, happy-go-lucky personalities, and I just get the feeling that we're going to grind that out of him. He'll, he'll be no, no, no. He was, he's still there. He's still upbeat. He's still happy-go-lucky. It was just, you know, when you see someone that is just really, really good at what they do, and like it's frustrated because you can't get a good show. I mean, it was funny. We did, we did that game on Sunday. And then um, afterwards with Lincoln Rose, I did the game, the Seattle Toronto game, which was a really good game and also a really good show. And we, we just called it, we called it the palate cleanser. Like I don't think any, any of us would have slapped if we had had the San Diego um, game be like the last game, but then we did Seattle and that worked really well. And then everyone was like, okay, good. Now, yes. now that was that was a really good show. But no, Reese is still upbeat. Dude, he's still upbeat. He's not. He's not going to lose that no. that happy go lucky Welsh. Great dude. All right, who was who were your big winner in week one? Who was the surprise and who was your disappointment for week one? Well, I think this is a little bit. I mean, it all comes from the same game. I called this game as well with Lincoln on Saturday. But I think biggest surprise has to be Houston. Agreed. Um, and and biggest disappointment is LA. And and we'll probably talk a little bit more about this game later, Dan. But the score flattered LA, like it wasn't mm. even that close. So I mean, th those two are the, are the two two ones that stand out for me. Surprise! Well, Biggest surprise, like in a positive way. Um, I think the Free Jacks. I think I actually called this on our, you know, Free Jacks going down Maca. to Nola. Um, Bowden Wacker looking like, you know, when they moved him to 10 last year, it transformed that team. And he just, he's come out of the gates like a man possessed. So um, I thought, I thought pleasant surprise is, is, is the Free Jacks being able to play. And the other pleasant surprise I would say is the Gil Groney scoring points. Because last year they had the best defense in the league, but couldn't score. That doesn't does, doesn't seem like that's going to be a problem this year. Yeah, my surprise is going to be Seattle. I didn't expect them to be as uh, well conditioned and and staunch as they were, especially defensively. Their organization against Toronto. In fairness, Toronto were were quite depleted in in the back line and had a an inexperienced ten, uh, which never helps your attack. But I thought the defense from Seattle looked really, really, really good. All right. Let's jump into it because one of the other teams that started their season with a win and are looking to get back to more successful days are the San Diego Legion, one of the perennial powerhouses. It just feels like yesterday they're in that you know championship game against Seattle, 2020 shortened, and that really looked to be their year. They were the dominant side in 2020, especially on the West Coast. 21, wow, no one really saw that coming. Uh, injuries, other things they faced – Location. We'll talk a little bit about that later as well. But there were some challenges 
um, that disrupted their 2021 season and it showed as they missed out on the finals uh, for the, I believe, the first time in their history. So let's talk to the man at the top. Pete, you had a chance to sit down with him earlier today, one of the owners at the Legion and one of the OGs in the league, Ryan Patterson. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome San Diego co-owner and MLR chairman Ryan Patterson to MLR kickoff. Uh, thank you for having me today. I appreciate the time, guys. Now, there's a lot of really exciting, exciting stuff going on with Major League Rugby and rugby in the U.S., but you're not a rugby player by background. Can you talk a little bit how you got involved in the game? Uh, no, I, I grew up playing football uh, in small town USA, and actually my kids are who got me involved in rugby. Uh, they've been playing since they were five and seven, and they played all the way through high school, and my son now in college playing, uh, just playing with his buddies, but not playing formally. But uh, I've had a chance to grow up with rugby with a lot of expatriates here in San Diego and watch my kids thoroughly enjoy and love the game. And it was a great opportunity to see how the game actually functions with people. And it's uh, it's it's just uh, it's been a, it's been a great experience. And so that's how we go in here. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. Well, Ryan, you are one of the original owners of Major League Rugby, one of the original seven. But not having the rugby background, how did you get persuaded to put money into this sport? Well, uh, yeah, we were the last of the seven actually to join. We were late to the party. Um, we had, I was, uh, I was asked to take a look at this opportunity with Matt Hawkins from the USA rugby side, as you know him, and David Poole, who is very involved with youth rugby even today in the youth and high school level. And they had the opportunity. They asked me to look at it. Uh, I looked at it with several other businessmen here in the local area. And we happened to actually be in Ireland at the time with my kids on an, on an Irish rugby tour. And all these boys have been playing together since they were seven. Now they're 14. You know, all you 14s are kicking butt. And all the Irish coaches are like, wow, this is the future of rugby in America. You have something to look forward to. And right around that time, we have decided, you know what, there's this opportunity to grow rugby and create a pinnacle aspirational point, if you will, for youth and high school and even collegiate rugby and we could see how this could all come together and really create something special in the United States. And I decided to jump in with both feet and not a lot of thought, not a lot of thought about it. And uh, here I am today. <laughs> so, so, so hold on. you didn't sign it after a few Guinnesses over in Ireland, did you? Because those Guinnesses go down very, very easily. Very easily. Sounds like you have experience too with the uh, Guinness thoughts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, it's it's you know great great to have someone um, come in early on. I mean, I'm sure that the, there was a huge amount of risk, but it feels like you have a lot of the the passion of the sport that you've taken from your kids. Can you talk a little bit about for you why rugby maybe is is a little different than some of the American sports? Oh, I, I think rugby embodies a lot. Excuse me, embodies a lot of things that our sports used to, um, and may don't always uh, today have that in mind. Forward in mind, I love the idea that the community, the aspects of the game. Everyone, if you play rugby, you can go anywhere in the world, and you can sleep on someone's couch, or they'll bring you into their community, or give you a place to stay. And all of those world traveling stories and the experiences that you want your kids to have, or you want to have are still there and available through rugby. Um, I love the fact that you get, you know, after the game, the kids come up and they can feel and touch and be next to the players and how much the players love them. I mean, so many of the off field things that, you know, sports are supposed to bring, I think rugby still has today, as well as one of the most unbelievable on field experiences that you can get. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me what rugby is, the non rugby players, if you will. To me, I think it's more like tackle basketball. If you ever wanted to see someone like Tyke tackle Michael Jordan, this is exactly what you want to watch. So, I think you've got it absolutely spot on. You know, you you look at the growth of the league and you look at um, where we've been. I mean, COVID was a dangerous time, like 2020 and even 2021 were dangerous times for the league. Did you have any concern in that time about the future of Major League Rugby? Um, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there was a lot of late night conversations with the other owners, a lot of discussion about how to proceed. Um, when you look to the other leagues and the other sports leagues, canceling, pushing off, delaying, how to handle things. Um, we had a lot of decisions to make, and I'm very proud of one of the decisions. The first decision that we made when we had to cancel 
the, the, the prior season was that we paid all of our players, right, all the way through for the season as if they played. And I think that that was historical and when you in comparison to other leagues. Uh, and then to jump back and then actually play a full season, and we went 99-0 and against COVID in the season that we played last season, even though it was absolutely brutal on us as an organization, as a league, I'm very proud of what we accomplished and to go forward with it. Where do you think the league has the best opportunity to grow? And where do you think the league has maybe the, the, the most work that it has to do? Um, I, I believe as we continue to evolve the teams and get better stadiums and create better events, we're capturing more and more mind share of people in the sport. We have to, to, to your point, which is what, what do we have to do to grow? We have to grab the non-rugby, but sports enthusiast. That's the, that is the absolute person that we need. Someone who likes football, basketball, baseball, those core sports, we have to, to get them to get involved in rugby. And we find that all we have to do is get them to one match or watch it one time. And uh, we've got a pretty good capture rate from that. So it's really just getting out in front of these people. And I think that ties well to the, rug, the rise of rugby campaign that you referenced. Um, what I continue to hear from people who are not part of the called core rugby base is that they love the ads. They love the ads. They love what it does. It, it captures their attention enough to go, what's next? What, what's, what, what do we learn out of this? So, um, Now, you know, the big news that came out last year is the bid to have the World Cup in the U.S. in um, 2031. I know that you're heavily involved in that. Before we talk about the World Cup, where would you like to see Major League Rugby in 2031? What does it look like a decade from now? I think you're going to see 26 plus teams uh, in all of the major markets in the United States, all with very active 20, you know, 12 plus thousand, maybe even greater stadiums, very, very similar to an MLS model, if you will. Um, I see a million kids plus playing the game, uh, all supported by MLR. And uh, I think youth is a huge component of that, of our growth and our future. And I would love to see, you know, I'd love to see us stabilizing, helping collegiate rugby across the U.S. as well as, as high school, too. Um, Ryan, I have to tell you that when you said a million kids playing rugby across the U.S., a little shiver went down my spine. I mean, that's a, that's a, that, yeah, I mean, that is a, a huge, like, you know, big, hairy goal. And you said supported by MLR. Can you talk about what MLR clubs plan to do around there? Like where MLR and the league, what they're trying to do around the development of the grassroots game? So what you mentioned right there, we have a grassroots program that allows us to actually increase our salary cap inside the MLR already. So we incentivize each team to get behind the community. And that is to support local teams, to support local high school teams, and also increase academy play and men's play at uh, at above U twenty. So if we're all if we're investing dollars in there, that allows us additional salary cap to pay players. So we're incentivizing the teams to do that. Um, almost all of our teams, if not all of our teams, this year are involved in all of those programs to some level. So I'm very proud of what we're accomplished and the steps we've taken, even despite COVID. <laughs> I just was going to say the other thing that uh, we're getting behind is and what is going to kind of go along with this World Cup is something we're launching. It's called the Imagine Rugby Program. Um, we've hired a director of youth and, and high school development at the MLR to, to support these programs. But Imagine Rugby's program over the next 10 years is to get all 63,000 elementary, which is K through eight schools exposure to rugby through an, an already set program and established ball in the bag program. So balls. Uh, QR codes with links to videos and how to play and programming. We're very excited about that. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and, and you need to have that long strategic view, right? So 2031 um, would be amazing for the game, but it would be even more amazing if the U.S. can make the quarterfinals of the World Cup. And the players that are going to be playing in um, 2031 are currently in high school or middle school. That is correct. So, yeah. So, so, yeah, you have to have that long term view. So talk a little bit about, you know, you're, you're an outsider, you're, you're stepping into Major League Rugby and now you're stepping into World Rugby, right, which, has, which is another part of our community. Can you talk um, about what drove you to take that, you know, look, owning an MLR franchise is not an, inexper an inexpensive activity. Hosting a World Cup is not an inexpensive activity. It might be 
like 10x, 20x, I don't know what it is, of an MLR franchise. Like what? Like that's a journey from someone who wasn't a rugby player to being experienced with their kids to you know, earning a professional team and now being involved in the bid. Can you talk about what that step and why being involved in the bid was important for you? Um, I, I think I spoke earlier about aspirational points. Um, we think that the MLR can be an aspirational point, which helps grow the bottom level of the game, almost like a pyramid to being the top of the game. Um, having the opportunity or even just, just the opportunity of getting a World Cup, but now with having that very much within our line of sight and to line up your growth goals to this pinnacle point where we could be having hosting a World Cup across the United States and Canada. Uh, I mean, the, the, you don't get a better scenario than that. You don't get a better opportunity in life than that to grow a business like those things. Um, it is a big bet. Um, I'm only in the front end of part of it, sponsoring, you know, working with USA Rugby, um, who's done a great job of, and I mean that, a great job of putting forth the information to World Rugby on why the U.S. is such a great place for that to be. Um, it's the investment that I think is worth making. My partner, Darren, and I have seen that. We've worked with a lot of the other MLR owners who believe the same thing, and they've all been very, very bullish on sponsoring, you know, this opportunity. It's great. It's so it's so exciting. All right. So that's the 10 year vision. Obviously, you're an aspirational guy. But let's talk about this coming year for the Legion. OK. And so um, you have great news that you're going to be moving into the Snapdragon Stadium next year. But talk about off the field. Obviously, you want to, you know, winning an MLR, cha MLR championship is the goal. But off the field, where would you like to see San Diego grow this year? Um, I think I'm already seeing it, which is first we have a home, <laughs> which was very different than last year. We played on the road. We moved to Las Vegas. We moved back. Um, you know, everything that goes along with that disrupting our players' lives, which I'm so sad for, you know, all the things that had to happen in order for us to play on the season were very tough on everybody. And so just already we have a better family community establishment. They're home. They're in that. We have a gym that for them. We have their living situation done. So for that, I'm I'm proud and happy. And you're already seeing that reflected in how how and what a positive attitude they have. Um, then the the addition of Danny Lee, uh, whose you know level of professionalism is, is just amazing, and you can already see that kind of flowing through the guys. I mean, they come to work every day. They love what they're doing, but it's a job, and they understand it. They're professional through and through. So I think that those things are already starting to see itself. Um, we got our first win, as you saw this week, which was really, really exciting. But the team last year, you know, and the team this year, you saw we didn't quit. You know, even when we were under pressure, even though Utah and all, the, and all, you know, hats off to them for what they did. They stuck through the whole game. We stuck through it, too. And I'm really proud of what we were able to do. Well, Ryan, it's great to have such a strong advocate for rugby who doesn't have a rugby background i think that gives us all hope as you said that we should be attracting more non-rugby fans to the game and all we have to do is expose them to it in a way that allows them to enjoy it and and they'll be stuck for life and and, and maybe maybe they won't be investing in a new team but they might be buying a shirt right they're, they're buying a beer they're doing all those other things that helps mlr um, uh, sustain for um, the long period. So really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for your support of rugby and good luck with the 2031 bid. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll get you guys out here in person whenever you're ready. <laughs> there you have it, Pete, one of the original owners for the league. And it's been good to talk. You know, you had Kimball on a couple of weeks ago, Ryan now as well. It's just great to hear the stories from those early days and the evolution you know, away from just the rugby side of things, just the evolution of business of Major League Rugby. Yeah, I, I always loved having these conversations, Dan. You know, I like to put my business hat on, see if I can pick up a little bit, some tips here and there. But, you know, Ryan Patterson's passion for the game, you know, as we heard, came through his kids. And so it's great to have someone that's that's really passionate and wants to build something, spe continue to build something special in San Diego. I mean, San Diego have something special going now. Um, and I think their move to the new stadium is going to be a, a really important step for that franchise. Yeah, everyone thinks buying your kids a pony is expensive. Try buying them a professional rugby franchise. That's expensive. Everybody, Ryan's like, I'll take the horse now, considering what I've just dived into here. But hey, the league's better to have guys like Ryan involved, and, and I'm glad the kids were able to twist his arm and, and keep him in the league. Uh, one of the great guys. And, again, San Diego – they always were that team that, you know, they had a down year, but you just knew. Even 
last year, like they're not going to stay here. They'll bounce back and, and yeah, they, yeah, I mean, you know, quality players, but I think the concern that I, I have is that some of their best players are a bit old and, and it, the, the challenge they had last year was injuries. So, you know, um, it, it, I, I think staying healthy, you know, I, Stats Boy and I have had this conversation before, but one of the biggest in- indicators of success in Major League Rugby is health. Um, Seattle basically won the first two championships because they were one of the most healthy teams. They had the shortest injury list when um, uh, you know teams get to like 45, 46 players that have played. It's really, really hard for them to compete. So um, staying healthy, you know, keeping that number or down to the mid-30s. 52. 52 was San Diego the first year, right? Uh, 52 was 52 was San Diego the first year, but 52 was Seattle last year. There you go. So big indicator, big indicator. Yeah. Martin Honor and I are born in the same year. I don't know how I feel on a Sunday or Monday morning. I don't play. So shout out. Yeah, to I, mean, I mean, it was, I just have to say that, you know, he came on as a sub and he had one chance to run with the ball and he like almost created a try. It was yeah. just like, it was like the one chance he had. I mean, the guy's still classy. Yeah. Thanks, Mark, making this feel great. He, uh, he, he'll he hit the 4-0 in the season, which is uh, credit to him. Tom Brady, well, I mean, 44, I mean, so four yeah, more normally, seasons. I mean, he's he's the rugby version of Tom, of Tom Brady, right? Because yeah. normally, normally when you're like, oh, someone in their late 30s, like they're just hanging on. No, this was a guy that in 2019 at 37 was in the World Cup squad for New Zealand. It didn't go. Yeah, yeah. He, like, like they, got, they took him back in there at 37 like for New Zealand. I mean, yeah. he's, he's not, last year he was playing too long. Like Division One rugby, this isn't a guy like it's, – it's nuts. But he is the Tom Brady. He's the guy that is, you know, hey, you look after yourself. You, have, you keep the passion for the game. You can play for as long as you want. Yeah, well, one of the most passionate players, not only in the Legion, but all MLR, is their scrum half, Nate Augsburger. Pete, absolute pleasure. Again, I've, I've been a big fan of this guy, not only for his Major League Rugby career, but also his international career for the Eagles in 15s and 7s. It was great to have him on the show. I think we've had him on before uh, a few years ago, but, again, always great to, to chat to a guy like Nate. So let's welcome him in once again, Nate Augsburger. All right, we are joined now by San Diego Legion Scrum Heart, Nate Augsburger, also USA Eagle, Nate Augsburger. Nate, appreciate you taking your time out and joining us on the show tonight, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me, gentlemen. Well, listen, the stalwart of the Legion, you've been there since since day one, um, a little step away for some USA stuff now and then, but overall you've been one of the centerpieces of the Legion's successes throughout the years. What's different? 2022, we step in. San Diego have knocked on the door once in a final. They've been in the semis a couple of times as well. What's different this year? Well, I think uh, last year, last year was one of our uh, down pits. As you as you've hinted, uh, we've had some success in previous years with with winning and making the playoffs and putting ourselves in posi- position to try and win a championship. But last year was a tough one, and uh, it's. Just nice to start out the season already with uh, proving our winning ways. It was good to get one over Utah. They're tough as nails, but um, yeah, we uh, we want we want to win this year, and we got we got to go out and show it. So right now we're just uh, just moving forward and turning a new page this season. Got a new coach with with Danny. Got a lot of new players in, and um, we're home. So that's also the good part to start the season is that we're in San Diego at our headquarters uh, where we can be at full strength. Yeah, we just saw some footage there of the uh, the Las Vegas Legion. Let's hope we never have to do that again, uh, an experiment. No one wants to go down that path again. Tell us about that 2021 season because California uh, was pretty strict on the COVID front to kick off the year and you guys were forced into a relocation. Talk us through that conversation when you found out and how you approached it. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the owners actually called me and, just like, hey, Nate, just so you're aware, uh, we're, we're going to be making a pretty big decision. Um, and I mean, first thing first was like, all right, well, what about my wife? Like, we're getting ready to relocate. What's going to happen with the families? Um, and at the end of the day, I, w- I was on board and I was I was ready to move to Las Vegas for the entire season. Um, they were the, in the exact same boat. They had organized for us to be there 
for the for the whole season. So um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big buy-in guy. Uh, I like to be pretty optimistic. I like to control what I can control. I mean, if you got to play in a parking lot, you play in a parking lot kind of guy. But um, that was definitely tough. And I think the odds were were pretty overwhelming once things got into motion. Our preseason was really short. Uh, we struggled to get guys in on time. We struggled to be fit for the regular season. And then um, before you knew it, we were actually on our way back home thinking that um, that was going to be the best decision ultimately get us comfortable again, which it did, but uh, just a really tough season to put everything together. And you know, so far this year, um, just being home and having a proper preseason, things have been a lot, a lot more enjoyable for all the players and their families. So, you know, Nate, I want to take you further back than last season. Um, I want to know when was the first time you saw a rugby ball? And um, how did you start playing? And when did you know that you would be, like, pretty good? Oh, good question. Um, I saw a rugby ball when I was, like, two years old. My, uh, my dad, he's an American guy. He played college football. And when he moved to Minnesota um, and met my mom, had me and my brother, he was playing club rugby. Uh, a bunch of guys got him out to play. So I grew up around a rugby field, uh, luckily, and uh, a bunch of the old – Old boys on the team uh, ended up teaching us, me and a couple other people, Katie Johnson, her dad, actually, Katie Johnson, the Olympian. Um, we grew up playing rugby together. We grew up across the street from each other. And uh, my, our dads played on the same team. So we started to get taught around 11 years old, like properly um, coached on the game. And uh, yeah, it was pretty, so that was pretty special. And then it wasn't until... Um, my senior year of high school, uh, we had gone to our third state championship um, for my club, Southside. And uh, I was actually playing fly half in that championship. And um, we won it. And I went off to the University of Minnesota to play with my older brother. And I played pretty well my freshman year at Scrum Half. And that's when I kind of knew, all right, this is, this is something I'd really love to be doing and, and try and take it to the highest level possible. And I've always wanted to be a professional athlete. Uh, if, if you looked at like, you know, five years old, what do you want to be when you grow up? It, it was like professional football. Um, but thank God I found rugby, you know? Well, I mean, you know, when you were a kid, there wasn't that pathway to be a professional rugby player. I mean, not in the U.S. You would have to go overseas. So talk a little bit about when you first heard about Major League Rugby and what, what were those steps that brought you as a professional athlete in the U.S.? Uh, wow. Well, first steps, when I heard uh, major league rugby was coming up, um, pro rugby had already happened. And, uh, I was, I was entertained by that, but I was with the sevens team during that time, getting ready for the 2016 Rio. So I wasn't a participant. I was kind of a bystander and I was a San Diego, uh, pro rugby fan. And, um, I was living in New York city. I had a full-time job at the, at the moment working for a, a coffee roasting company. And I was waking up early in the morning to go train in Midtown, New York city, then take the train over to Brooklyn, go do my uh, standing up coffee roasting gig. And then I would head up to the tip of Manhattan to Columbia university to train with old blue. And uh, Matt Hawkins hit me up and he was like, Hey Nate, would you be interested in playing for the San Diego Legion? Um, and I, I jumped at it right away. My wife was on board and I ended up moving back out to San Diego. So pretty, pretty, uh, cool opportunity that fell away from my lap. So, um, let's talk about that. What was most surprising for you about that first year of major league rugby? What were some of the things that stood out for you? Well, I think, I think one thing was, uh, the competition level, it was better than club, you know, it was, it was much better than club than, than the level we were playing at. Um, and there was still a, a lot of American guys playing in the competition at the time. Um, but I think if you look at the progression, it's just every single year there's, I mean, I, I couldn't put a percentage on it, but every single year the competition has just gotten a little bit tougher, a little bit harder to compete in, a little bit better and a little bit better. And so that first year was was really fun to just kind of be a part of the inaugural. Um, I know that there was the the ARC was in the heart of the the season, so I was one of the guys that left and went to USA. And then 
before you knew it, San Diego was actually making a run with the players that we had and, and they got us in the playoffs. So I was able to play in a few games, go to USA, come back and jump, jump on a team that was really hot and we got to play in the playoffs. So that was pretty sweet. But I, I just love where the competition's going, getting better every year with the type of players that are coming, the attraction to the league and the standard and the coaching level is going up every year as well. All right, personal question now. I'm going to go back to the coffee roasting. Mate, what makes a good cup of coffee? <laughs> Arabica beans. No, um, <laughs> I think, I think, honestly, though, it is, it's where it comes from. Uh, I love a good Ethiopian drip. That's that's just me. I'm not a coffee snob, but if I were to say uh, I like I like Costa Rica. Hold on, hold on. I'm not a coffee snob, but I like an Ethiopian drip. I'm a bit of a coffee snob, that's and that's not how snobby. I talk about my coffee. <laughs> Um, hey, the, the coffee roasting company got me, got me in the know, in the know. You actually live longer if you drink coffee as well. Um, everything in moderation, but, of course. you well, know. What was the, what was the coffee in the movie, The Bucket List, that Jack Nicholson drinks that the animal has to eat it and then poop it out for the bean oh, to be prepared? it's a properly. very expensive, uh, I know, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember the name of it, so. I've, I've failed that test. I failed my, uh, Brooklyn roasting coffee, co- coffee company um for not knowing that but uh yeah that's like a super expensive yeah yeah it's like a, a, not a, not a lima but there's something has to eat it yeah and yeah they, they find it, it in the, the cocoa being there and the, the bean yeah. there. oh <laughs> man I'm, I'm not touching that coffee deep origin story <laughs> here back into the coffee roasting days mate let, let, let's talk a little bit about last year because it was a it was a rough year for, for San Diego, for not only the players, but the fans as well. It took forever, it felt like, to get back into Torero. Um, you, you had some injury struggles throughout the year, as did the entire Legion side. It, it kind of was a little bit of a, a epidemic there running through. How was the feeling in the squad? Um, how, did, how did you handle the, the two head coaches? What was basically the, the, the feel for the Legion and the players with all the travel, the uncertainty and leading into last year and then through that season? Yeah, so um, the co-head coaches thing, I mean, it was really tough. So as an injured guy, I tried to I tried to step up as much as I could with helping the team prepare week to week. So I had a bit more time to look at the team we were going to play the following week. Um, tried, to, tried to help facilitate that for the coaches as uh, we didn't have a full-time defensive coach. It was just Scott – in, in Zach. So I think uh, when you look at a coaching staff of just two people, um, you really got to rely on the players and the leadership of the players. And uh, it was just, it was just one, a, a tough thing to keep up with as the year went on, as we became more and more injured, we lacked depth at times. Um, so it was a lot of adapting and, and trying to overcome. So my, my thing is, uh, you know, most of the guys, we just had to try and be the best teammate you could be on the day. And, and sometimes that's, that would be like coming in and just bringing a little happy energy or, or whatever. Other times it was, like I said, coming in a bit more prepared to help the guys be uh, ready for what they're going to face on the weekend. Um, but it was just hard and, and we just didn't get the balance right. Uh, we never got the life balance right, you know, the on the field, off the field stuff, which I think is always really crucial and really important. So um, we still played some really good rugby, and we actually made it interesting last season, which is a testament to to the boys and, and the way they tried to pitch up. But I think ultimately it was just a bit too overwhelming, and taking those losses at home in Torero were, were really tough on us. And I'll tell you what, but just getting a win yesterday in front of some fans for 2022 uh, meant a lot to us because we just wanted to owe it to the fans that um, we're a team that they can get behind this year. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird the announcement that you guys had to leave Torero, move to a, you know, probably most people say a downgrade stadium, and then all of a sudden, bang, Snapdragon announcement the week before, and you're going into this giant stadium, which is going to be awesome next year. But you, you mentioned leadership. I want to kind of touch on leadership because you were kind of thrust into that role as a pretty young player. I believe I spoke to you at the Ireland USA game. You captained your country, right, at Red Bull? Yeah. That would yeah, have been 2016? 
Yeah, 2016. Well, 15 maybe? Was there, no, 16. No, I think it was, 16. It was 2016 or it might have been 2017. Apologies for getting my dates wrong. But. Yeah, but, but young, like a young captain. Who, who are some of your role models? Like obviously you're a great leader to be chosen um, at that time. I think it was John Mitchell uh, to, yep. to lead the side. But who are some of the inspirations you looked up to as a role model uh, that you model not only your game on, but also the way you lead a team? I think uh, definitely Toddy, Todd Clever, man. He was, he was really important because um, at the time, you know, Todd was getting ready to transition out and it was kind of around that world cup qualifying. And um, we knew Todd was going to be retiring soon. And so I really got to learn a lot from Todd and he's a, he's a very player focused leader. Um, he wants the team to be put first. He wants the guys to be happy and be looked after in the right way. So I got to learn a lot um, aside from leading on the field and, and whatnot. I just got to learn a lot about how to how to be that guy, how to facilitate for the boys and, and learn from Todd. But also, you know, Todd believed in me, which meant everything because as as I captained that Ireland game, you know, Todd was still on the team. And that was like an opportunity where it was like, Hey Nate, like we we got to get you out there and we got to get you some some experience in this role, and and Todd just always backed me. He he always believed in me. He always was like, "Go just be the dog you are" kind of guy. And um, so I think Todd was Todd was super important. And I think I, I was pretty fortunate to join the team when I did. There's just a lot of guys that I got on with uh, that I played with before, um, and it just it made it it made it even better. So um, yeah, it's always. It's always been a, a, a bit of inspiration from the guy who has kind of ha- handed it over to you, you know, and, and Todd yeah. was that for me for sure. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's let's talk about you as a leader now. Um, you talked about how rough the, the start of 2021 was, um, came in and had a great game this past weekend against a strong Utah team that made the playoffs last year. Talk a little bit about how different the prep has been this year. Well, first things first, we, we've been at our headquarters and we at San Diego, we have a very cool, very good setup. Um, we have a gym, we have turf where we can work on uh, micro skills. Uh, we have a basketball hoop. So the boys get to have fun. We get to shoot around, play lightning and, you know, have some 3v3 games and whatnot. Uh, we have a locker room, our medical staff. I think that's been one of the best increases we've had this year as well is we've been uh, very much more prepared in the physio department and have some really good people that are working their butts off for us, making sure that we're healthy. We have like a recovery lounge. So there's a lot of things um, just from being home. And then I call headquarters home because we spend our time there, right? We have our meetings and everything there. Um, that just, it just facilitates all the, all the small percentages that we want to get better, but also the camaraderie of us just having a place where we can be around one another. Um, uh, the other part of being home this preseason is, you know, as guys have come in, when we finish our training sessions, our hard days, we're putting in those fitness sessions that, you know, that we got to go through to be prepared for the season. Uh, guys get together, we, we share cars, we get over to the beach and we hop in the ocean. And I think, uh, you know, that's definitely, a uh, uh, a pleasure for us and, and a perk of being in San Diego, but it's really something that keeps you, uh, keeps you grounded. You just really enjoy and you have a, a heart of gratitude when you're uh, enjoying yourself like that. So, um, yeah, I think, I think those are two massive things that have happened this preseason. And then uh, the other thing I'd say is uh, having Danny Lee uh, come in in December and his impact, he's just been a, a, a really precise, um, driving force for us and, and he's doing a great job as a head coach and he's fair play. He's gotten us prepared. Um, we had a, we had a week long mini camp down in Chula Vista where we got to spend a lot of time around the Austin Gilgronies, but, um, we got to spend a lot of time as a team and iron some things out and, you know, uh, we're, we're a team on the same mission and, and that's what you need building up into a regular season. So, uh, we're expecting to, to, to be on the same, same mission all year. All right, a couple of quick ones and we'll let you get to bed, mate. Play the yeah. Dallas Jackals this weekend. New franchise, they don't get up to a hot start. Austin, though, we, we talked a little bit before we went on 
on air here. Uh, Austin looks good this year. What do you make of the new franchise? They're coming into your home ground this weekend. Yeah, I think uh, they they seem like a really prickly side. Honestly, I mean, if you watch if you watch the first twenty minutes, um, there's there's definitely a contest there. These guys are have got some really good individual players. Um, they're going to bring it. I mean, no one's going to lay down in week two and think, oh, this this thing's this thing's over already. I mean, they're they're new to the league and they want to prove themselves. So you got to respect that and respect the individual talent that they have on that team. And uh, we'll have to be prepared because we we're going to be at home again. It was a great environment, you know. It was you, you referred to Torero and then us being where we're at now, and then Snapdragon. I think yesterday was way way more fun and and way more pleasurable than maybe what we thought it was going to be. And there was fans in the stands. We got to see them after the game, and it was it was really good. So we're we're excited to take on someone else at home uh, at our home ground and. You know, Dallas is next up, so. All right, last one. As a young kid in Minnesota, did you ever think you'd find yourself in the predicament of Cripps Robshaw wanting a short ball off the back, Nonu wanting it flat wide, or Peterson looping down the short side? Wanting, like, who are you going to give it to if all three <laughs> ask at the same time? Oh, man. Wow. You know, Robshaw runs some great lines, really underrated. And he had the one uh, in the game where he ran he off the great line line break and slide. Yeah, yeah, and you got the got the little line break. He's he's I, I actually love when we start playing touch at practice. He's always good for a little a little line break, a cheeky line break around the around the breakdown. So I love that from Rob Shaw, but you know, it's a pretty high percentage play whenever you're giving the ball directly to Moss. So uh, and and then Joe, me and him have been doing it for years. I, I know where he's gonna be at. You you're putting me at, it's a very tough predicament, you know? And I'm guessing well, you're gonna find yourself in it though. I guess it depends on where we're at on the field. Joe loves to run it out from inside our 22. So, uh, you know, I like that. And then, you know, if, if we're up in this inside the 22, maybe I'm taking Ma and then Rob Shaw is good for a cheeky bust in the midfield. So, Mate, just that's, that's rush all three and go yourself, Nate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes I do. And, and, you know, I'll hear from them if I do. Well, mate, absolute pleasure having you on the show. It's been a pleasure watching you uh, the first four years of Major League Rugby and for the USA Eagles. Hopefully it continues for years to come here. Good luck this weekend against Dallas and for the rest of the season if we don't catch up. I'm sure we will. But it's been, uh, like I said, a pleasure having you on the show, mate. They appreciate it, guys. And well done on the weekend, Pete. I know you're working your tail off commentating these games, man. And uh, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, guys. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate he, it. He's talking. It's never a chore. He loves it. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. Nate Augsburger there, San Diego Legion scrum half and all-around champion bloke as well. I, I just love the fact that you've got this homegrown, just dominant player at nine and he's just got this talent all around him. It's going to be a great year for him. I, you know, hopefully depending on what Gary Gold's doing here, we've got qualifiers and whatnot coming up. You know, Nate's got to be a big part of it. He's just such a great player. Well, and, and he's versatile, right? So he's such a good athlete because he can play on the wing, he can play at scrum half, but you you saw the, the best parts of San Diego's game was when Nate Augsburger was involved. Like he can play that ball. He's a good runner. He, he attracts defenders. Um, yeah, I mean, he's it, like the game he had is one of probably one of the best games he's played. And so if he plays like that, I think, you know, thinking about that next World Cup is definitely something that, um, you know, he should be doing. Yeah. Like you said, versatility, huge uh, plus that he, he takes in right. the ability to play 15 uh-huh. wing nine and even even said started at 10. So, you know, wouldn't be too much of a, a stretch to have him at 10 as well. All right, Pete, we're going to talk here a little professor's breakdown rugby 101. We are going into the area of the game that I never went. Like <laughs> this was the only reason I never got tackled is because I didn't want to go here. Uh, it was too confusing for me. Can you break it down? The breakdown. I can break down the breakdown. So let's talk about this. So, um, you know, and, and I'm going to give a little history, Dan. So back in the day, like back in, you know, when rugby first came to the States, rugby was like, was actually like football. So when a tackle happened, the game stopped, right? But as, as the game evolved, 
what they did is they created an opportunity for the game to continue. And so what happens is there's a contest for possession when a tackle happens. And there's an order of things that have to happen, right? So the first thing that has to happen is the tackle has to roll away. So there's a really, some really interesting um, calls by um, over the weekend. Mike Lashley, I thought, had a good game for Seattle in the Seattle-Toronto game. You know, was penalizing people for not going, not rolling away. Scott Green in the Houston LA game, LA got penalized off the park for not rolling away. The tackler has to roll away first because that allows the tackled player who has the ball to then what's called play the ball. And play the ball means that you can pass it or you can place it. And you want to place it back towards your team because when you place it back towards your team, um, it gives your team the best chance to win. And then you get people that come in and join the ruck, right? And so there's a tackle, and then you get pe- um, players coming from the attacking side and the defensive side, and they're trying to get over the ball first. Because the ball is placed, if the ball is placed well back towards the attacking team, they have an advantage. It's easier for them to get over the ball, and they will win it. If they are not, if the ball isn't presented well, or if the attacking team is... Um, you know, is a little slow, then the defense has a chance to get their hands on the ball and create a turnover. You often hear this called a poach, where they're poaching the ball, right? A little bit like my uh, daughter's, you know, we're, we're doing Danny, the champion of the world, right? So a poacher that goes and gets the pheasants, right? But this is someone that poaches. Lucas Rumble, we've we talked about him before. Defensively, he's one of the best poachers. Um, uh, so look, you know, look for those defenders to come in. Um, but often what happens is that the defender gets there at the same time as the attacker and the attacker has to be really good at getting their hands off the ball and then taking that defender to the far side. So trick is to understand the order of what happens. Tackled player must roll away first and then um, tackler, sorry, (laughs) tackler must roll away first. Tackled player must place the ball and then there's a contest. And two things to just think about the contest that you'll see penalties and we're seeing them in the game. Right. So one is losing your feet. You are not allowed to use your feet to pre- to prevent a contest. And so wh- whether you're the attacking or the defending player, you must get beyond the ball before you lose your feet and you must not prevent someone else from contesting it. So you have to stay on your feet. And then the second thing is you have to come in over the top of the ball. You can't come in on the side. And Dan, interestingly, I've seen, you know, we've seen more calls this weekend of players coming in on the side on attack. You don't often see it on attack, but there was a couple of calls this weekend, which is pretty rare seeing players come in on the side from attack because they want that fair contest. Everyone has to come from and come over the ball. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. That's why I just kicked it and just figured no break down. <laughs> it, it, I will tell you, Dan, it's, it's interesting. So, you know, we were both backs. I was a scrum half late Nate Augsburger, right? So I didn't rock. Like, you don't want your scrum half to rock. But when, as a coach... What I realized is the most important things in the game are the set piece, so scrum and line out, and that contact point. And you can't really do anything if you don't win the ball, either at the set piece or at the contact point. And so, you know, I actually became more of a student of that contact point. Um, like Laurie Fisher, seeing, you know, I went down to the Brombies. Laurie Fisher is an absolute expert at it. I mean, this is a guy that has, you know, which foot you put first and like foot and shoulder and all that sort of stuff. But it makes a difference because if you can't win that ball and you can't win it quickly, right, then you can't actually play. And that's one of the things that like Seattle did against Toronto is that Seattle were able to really slow down the ruck. Toronto could never get fast ball because they never got fast ball, they could never get outside that defensive seawall. So, so it's really, really important if you want to play. And, and you know, teams like LA, like Houston prevented LA from doing it. The Free Jacks prevented NOLA from doing it. Like the teams that really want to play that wide, expansive game, you have to be good in that contact. You have to be able to do, you have to be able to play in space and in tight if you want to do that. All right. You mentioned Houston, LA. It was our interesting game of the week. And uh, it didn't disappoint. And there's a lot to there's a lot to dissect here. So don't think many people outside of Houston diehard fans saw this result coming. I, I mean, can't we, we go, like um, stats boy? Can't you look up at Super, on Super Brew and see? Like I think who actually I think picked, picked, yeah, who picked oh, it. There'll be some Houston fans on there that would have uh, picked Houston for sure. 
Oh, I, 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 I got it. Let, let me have, let me see see what we have. Uh, I'll keep talking so people don't get bored. Here are my thoughts on the match. I thought LA looked a little complacent and underdone. They looked a little flat, uh, almost as though they were expecting things to happen that happened last year because they were LA. Um, on the flip side, full credit to Houston. You know, they had been uh, historically as a team, as a club, They'd been in that situation before. They went pretty close against LA last year, couldn't get the the, the biscuits at the end. Uh, so there was a history there of not coming through in those tight games against, you know, better competition against the bigger teams. Heineke Meyer, Human Pote, credit, credit. So JT on yet as well, you know, the the lawyer family, the whole organization that went out and said, hey, and they, and they copped some criticism for burning it down and getting rid of some players and, and starting fresh. But, you know, the easy way to shut up the critics, Pete, win games. Win. And they're win. straight out of the gate. They beat the defending champions. So it, uh, it looks like the weather was chilly, but warmer, sunnier days ahead for Houston and their fans. So of the 52 people in – the MLR kickoff Super Bowl pool. Which everyone should join. Still not too late to join. Right. And, and hold it, hold it. Because it's not in the rundown for some reason. But who's in the top three? Is it Dan? Uh, Is it no, Stats Boy? It's, it's, it's neither Dan nor Stats Boy. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. It, it will be the only time I'm in the top three. Yeah, don't win those chances. To make sure we talk about. So three people out of 52 in yeah. the MLR kickoff pool picked Houston. One guy picked a draw. Everyone else. <laughs> Everyone else. I feel, like, I feel like that's when you just like just click it and you haven't got a score in. You like kind of work work your way down. So so a couple of things, a couple of things about this game that's really interesting. First of all, one of the things that kind of shocked me, Dan, was there wasn't a response from LA. I'm just pulling up the stats here. So um it was eight three to LA at halftime. LA scored a great try, one of those tries from 50 meters out. They ended up just, you know blowing away and you're like, here they go. Um, but after that, after about the first 10 minutes, it was absolutely all Houston for the rest of the game. But, and um, LA had two yellows at the, like they were down to 13 players and Houston were in their 22, like the LA defense going into that half time. I mean, Houston had so many chances. They probably had three or four kicks that they didn't take. And at half time, LA goes in eight, three, having withstood, like that barrage by Houston for like the last 15, 20 minutes of the half. And I was like, all right, LA going to come out. Just like you said, maybe they're a little complacent at the start, but they're going to come out and they're going to take it to these guys. And they never did. And Houston were like absolutely dominant. Like, like the, the score line actually doesn't do, um, you know, flatters LA, a couple of really interesting stats. So, um, you know, total tackle attempts by uh, um, uh, by LA two hundred and three. Total total tackle attempts by Houston one hundred and seventeen. Mm. But listen to this: eighty one passes by LA, LA, and eighty five passes by Houston. So what that means is that so much of Houston's game was picking and going along the edge near the line. Right? They didn't have to pass it. Right. So that was that was a problem. And then the, the big issue that, that L.A. had throughout the game is they couldn't play the game in the right part of the field. Right. You, um, we heard that from a couple of coaches uh, when they were interviewed this weekend. And that was because they were they, they were penalized off the park. Right. They 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 had. Um, let me just have a look. Uh, I'm going to pull this up. They had 20 penalties against them. Like 20 penalties is what you would like kind of in um, total. Yeah. Yeah. Total. Uh, four of those was, were malls. That's, that's where one of the yellow cards was coming where they just weren't able to, to stop the Houston mall. Um, but you know, seven in general play, like just not like they just, you know, they, they were flat. They didn't look good. You know, we heard from Luke White last year, last week talking about how important their Hawaii trip was and how special mm. it was. They didn't have that this year. You know, new coach, you know, big, big difference. Darren Coleman, very, very experienced head coach, right? Um, you know, Hoyle's it going to learn as he goes. Yeah, I, I'm i okay if I'm LA. Like, I, I think Matt Gitto comes back into the side. Yeah. They're, they've got so much classic. Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, and, and I would say that Luke Byrne is a really solid rugby player, but he's probably a better 12 from them than, than 10. And of course, you know, when you when you know, because they didn't have Giddo and they don't have Cardi, Cardi's out for like quite a while. And then you don't have Boot, you know, Burton in, in another spot in the bat line. They weren't great, but it was the scrum and the line out. Like, you know, Dave Dennis is probably the best line out jumper, one of the best in the league. And Houston caused all sorts of problems defensively in the line out. And um, Houston had the edge in the scrum the whole game. Mm. And so there's definitely some things to be fixed in that set piece for LA. Yeah. The, um, I think Luke Burton was probably one of the most underrated players last year. Like in a star started Guillotini right. side, he quietly put together a pretty impressive season and he was a big part of that championship run. And he played a fullback. Like he stepped into that fullback role, which, and he did it really well, but yeah, I think you welcome back Gitto into that side. You give uh, Meeks and Lasage a little bit more time. How much time did uh, Chambers get? Um, he came on with about 25 minutes to go, but they never had the ball. Like, like I think he, he had one pretty good kick, the, the, like pretty good attacking kick, but we didn't, I don't think, I don't, I don't remember seeing him run with the ball when he, when he came on in the second half because like the penalties, they were always in the back foot. They were always looking to clear, and so he didn't get a he didn't get a chance to do much. But that's someone that I was excited to see come on the field. But you know they need to get their set piece in order to be able to open up space for those yeah. sorts of things. Yep, yep. Well, let, let's take a look at this week's games. We'll run through them really quickly, and then we'll talk about our interesting game. And surprise, surprise, LA will be involved in that one as well. Uh, we kick off on oh, it's Thursday. Short turnaround for these two sides. They played on Sunday. They've got a Thursday night game. 10.30 Eastern, it's Utah at Seattle, back at Starfire. That one's on the Rugby Network, so make sure you pull up the app and tune in. Uh, I've got that on the screen now. I always have to sign in, though. I feel like if I don't watch the Rugby Network for two days, they just card me like a piece of rubbish, and I've got to sign in again. I'm like, what was I thinking uh, 18 months or 12 months ago when this thing launched? What was my password? What was relevant? You know, the professor sucks or something like that. I probably would have been doing. <laughs> I would have lost a Super Brew week to him. Most certainly. All right, moving on. Friday night footy. So we got Thursday night footy, Friday night footy. Geez, I wish this was consistent because I love this saturation. Me too. It's LA at Toronto. This one on the Rugby Network and then TSN up there. Well, oh, didn't get your, your picks on this one. Utah, Seattle. Who do you like here? Um, I like Seattle. I thought yeah, they looked too. really good. Their seawall looked great. Um, Utah, Utah came back as they always do, right? Against mm-hmm. San Diego, that they're, they're, they're very difficult. They've still got their depth. Um, I think the scrum's going to be really interesting. Um, but I just think Seattle at home, I think if Utah was at home, I'd probably pick them. But, um, you yeah, know, yeah. uh, Seattle are going to really come in with some confidence, and that team with confidence is dangerous. Yeah, big Oli Khalifi scored the try that won Utah this game last year in Seattle. So a little bit of uh, revenge on the mind for the, the Seawolf players. Uh, LA Toronto in BC. We'll talk about this one a little later. So hang on on that one. That one, like I said, Rugby Network and TSN in Canada. Jump now to Saturday afternoon. It's Dallas at San Diego. That one at four Eastern uh, on the Rugby Network. Who do you like here, Pete? The Jackals, a tough introduction to Major League Rugby against Austin. Probably not going to get any easier out in San Diego. Yeah, I think I think this is this is San Diego. San Diego looked looked really good, and you know Marnonu came on for a little cameo because he just turned up this week. So um, you know, as we heard from Nate Augsburger, you know Chris Robshaw had a great game. That's a guy that has has a lot left, and uh, um, you know Basson looked good. Uh, I think it's going to be a tough a tough game for Dallas. Super happy that Rob Shaw's back. Like it would have been pretty easy for him to say, "Ah, oh, I got hurt. The American thing didn't work out." But to come back and really, and, and not only come back, but come back and play the way he did in week one, testament to who he is as a person and as a rugby player. So awesome stuff. I know. I know he's probably like just waiting for my endorsement of him as a player, and that's like you now he's going to be. I can retire now. Got to. I've got the Panthers' tick of approval. <laughs> it's all good. All right. Uh, I'll go go San Diego with you on this one. Moving on, 4 p.m., kicking off at the same time on the Rugby Network as well. The servers will be working overtime. Atlanta on the road against NOLA. Well, this is, I mean, this is the rivalry, right? This is like one of the big rivalries. We we know it's going to be a close game. We know we're going to grind it out. Atlanta looked really good. NOLA, not so much. Um, I think 
they, they, you know, both teams lost head coaches close to the close to the season. Um, assistant stepped up. So this is a tough one. I think I'm going to go with Atlanta, but I think it's going to be a really close one. Boring week. Me too. I was actually really impressed with ATL, especially in that second half against Old Glory. Uh, first half, both sides looked a little rusty, but Atlanta made some transitions and they looked a lot more dynamic under Stephen Brett than, than last year. They were just that very defense orientated uh, methodical, the old boa constrictor, right. just slowly sucking the life out of teams that uh, I'll go ATL as well. All right, late one on Saturday. There's two games 30 minutes apart. 8 p.m. Eastern is the first one. It's New York at Houston. Uh, the new glamour boys of Major League Rugby, the Houston Sabercats, taking on New York. Their first game. They, they had a first round bye. Pete, are you calling Are you calling any of these? I probably should. I'm not calling any of these now. Okay, I'm beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, I have a couple of weekends off. Good man. What do you like here? I mean, this is like, this is really interesting because I saw Houston really impressed by them. We haven't seen New York yet. And the question is, did Houston get like new player, new coach bounce in their first game? Um, or are they actually that good? And I actually think they're that good. Um, yeah, real strong South African spine. I think New York's good. I think it'll be close, but I think Houston takes it because they're at home. Yeah, I was pretty fortunate to get a chance to chat to Heineke Meyer today and Mate, obviously, guy coached the spring box, right? I, I think and in our conversation, he goes, the only box I never ticked is the World Cup, you know, winning a World Cup. And that's uh, if that's the last box on your world rugby <laughs> coaching. <laughs> you've board, had a pretty good rugby career. You've had a really good career. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm i bullish on I'm bullish on Houston. And I'll give them the edge here at home just because we saw the teams in week one were a little underdone and I think the emotion and the extra week, uh, mate, Houston get this Batman, one man them in Seattle had this just this contentious bite to them wasn't it the way they were playing yeah, Houston. Houston. Yes, good, Houston. good contribution thanks yeah. thanks <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on 8 30 Eastern Saturday night we still Saturday night we are Saturday night oh no Sunday games that's all right go to brunch with your family be be do something with your family Sunday. Nothing on. Oh, it's Super Bowl. <laughs> That's why there's no game Sunday. Yeah, Smart good, good scheduling, cool. George and Bill. Good work. You're ahead <laughs> of me. All right. It's DC at Austin. Old Glory. Oh, they, they didn't look good in their first game where Austin. Uh, that uh, back one. I mean, DC, DC's got a young team, right? Um, and yeah. I think like they, they, they held on for a while against Atlanta, but Atlanta too much. I think we might see the same hit here. I think Austin have the depth. I think they look, I mean, Austin looked like a real, a, you know, a really, really good team. I can't wait for, you know, um, to see Austin play some of these other guys. I think, I mean, look, this is going to be Austin. I think it's going to be Austin by a few, but I think DC will show that they can play and hopefully they'll grow into the season. Yeah, was, yeah, got to give a shout out to Mike DeBoulos playing at 10. Hasn't, you know, seen a lot of 10 during his Major League Rugby career. I'd be very tempted to let him grow into that position. Ball in hand, he had a couple of really good performances. Uh, defensively, just needs a bit of polish on how he's reading and communicating. Same with his distribution and kicking, but there was enough there where I would just say, hey, this, that's your jersey. 2022 is your year. Grow into it. Right. Uh, if I'm Andrew Douglas, maybe getting him in contact with some of my old players from New Zealand, old experience 10s. There, there's actually one going to New Orleans that uh, it'd be interesting to have a conversation with maybe after right. the season. But, yeah, uh, I, I thought Taboulis looked w was a bright uh, spot for Old Glory out of that performance. Great. But I'm going for Austin as well. Yeah. All right, let's jump into the big one. It's LA Toronto. And we talked in a little bit before we jumped on the show that it's crazy to think one of these two teams will be 0-2 to start the year after this game, provided that there is not a draw. Uh, so if the person who picked the draw for Houston LA is going for another draw on this one, let me know. What are you thinking? What are you thinking here? This one's in BC, so first MLR game up in Vancouver. But what are you thinking in terms of how both these sides are going to approach this matchup? Yeah, I mean, I think that for LA, it's got to be around their set piece. You know, they, they, you know, they had their, their, I think their number one pack was there. Um, you know, they, they had their number one line-out jumpers. It was a problem. Um, they had the number one. Um, Adam um, Ash. Is Adam Ash there? Adam Ash wasn't there. That's the, but, but they had Cottrell. They had um, Dennis. 
Yeah. You know, they, you know, they had Dean Muir. I mean, you know, so it, it was, it was a really interesting challenge. Um, so, so but I think they'll fix that. I think they'll fix that. I think that they'll, they'll, they'll be able to fix that. Uh, for Toronto, you know, I, I think this is going to be one of these ones where it depends who they have in their bat line. Yeah. Like, if, is Sam Malcolm back? If Sam Malcolm's back, then they can be very competitive in this game. If he's not back, I think it's going to be it's going to be um, hard going for them. You know, they had uh, McCann, who's a former seven star that like just came back. I think he left because of a head injury, so don't know if he'll be able to play this week. Um, they yeah. really struggled against the pressure defense that that Seattle had. And their backs just looked a little disjointed. So it depends on who they can bring back into that back line, I think. Yeah, and it's not a center pairing that you really want to go into with an experience like Meeks and Lesage. Like, you know, Lesage is going to be up for this one. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Always your old team. A lot of current Canadian teammates and former teammates for the Arrows. He's not going to want to be on the losing side uh, and have them have that over him where I, you made the wrong choice. You know, you went to LA, you went to the the glitz and the glamour, you should stay here and we got it done. So if Toronto go in a little underdone in the back line, Pete, I would expect Meeks and Lesage to be probably in your top players just just yeah. because they're that good. And, and also I would say like one of the things that really impressed me about um, Toronto against Seattle was they actually matched up physically with the Seawolves. I mean, the Seawolves are big, right? They've got big players. They were really physical with them. And Toronto matched that even though they were a little bit undersized in the forwards. So they got that parity in the forwards, but just in the backs, they weren't quite able to get like, like, and Seattle's pressure defense, like they had um, Yosefo and Neil coming in from the outside that led to, you know, Neil's um, interception, but Yosefo was able to come in and cup up, you know, so they're, they're really pressuring them and they don't play that defense. Right. And so the back line's going to have a little bit more time. And so it's going to be, you know, maybe they'll get a little bit more chance to show, but you know, it, it's at least it's a short trip for them, so recovery will be quick, and they'll be able to get on the training field and get a lot of that work done this week. Yeah, it's gonna be. Wait, what did you say about my mate, my, my my BFF Brad Tucker? I turn on the the telly, and next thing you know, he's gone. Yeah, I mean, poor Brad. I mean, it looked like he had. I, I think that felt looked like a head injury too. He had some blood on his head, but you know, he's such a good player for them, and had you know such an injury disrupted season last year that we we hope he's able to come back and 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 um have an impact for the seawolves again call me bradley let me know you're okay no i'm just kidding he already texted me he's okay that's all i got <laughs> i think i think i think i get uh the second text behind mom he texts mom hey i'm okay and then he's oh, i better text dan as well he's probably <laughs> panicking and fretting away but no <laughs> it should, it should be a good one. i'm actually really looking forward to that la toronto game pete yeah. uh just even if one of them is 0-2, still not that worried because both quality rosters. So Yeah, and, and it's going to be great to have that game up in BC. I mean, you know, we uh, um, talked to Bill Webb and he talked about wanting to be uh, um, Canada's team and they get invitations all over the place. So hopefully, you know, my guess is it's going to be a really big crowd and it's a small stadium there, but, you know, I've, I've been there a couple of times with the national team and it's small, but it, it, it can create a bit of an atmosphere. So um, it would be, I think, I think the, uh, you know, the BC rugby crowd will be good. And, you know, hopefully this is a bit of a test for potentially a BC team. I think it's one of the holes that we have in North America where there's a real hotbed of rugby, but there's not an MLR team. Yeah, you were saying when you coached the women's Eagles up there, the, the, they used to pay the refs off to cheat against you. So you will see. Yeah, they didn't know. do that. They just made sure that our accommodations weren't as good as their accommodations and the fire alarm and three really yeah. inconvenient. Like, like it's like like you know, which is you know, it's it's the reason why the men's team always play their World Cup qualifier in Newfoundland because you can't get from the US to Newfoundland without two flights and like all their hotels always the one like a long way away from from like where the training pitch is because Canada have booked up all the other hotels supposedly. Like it's just, you know, Canada plays some silly buggers to get an advantage for it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see this weekend. Yeah. What was, uh, what was the chef's name that poisoned the All Blacks? <laughs> see if she gets a job in. Allegedly. 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 Poisoned the All Blacks. Sorry, thank you, thank you. Very litigious. That's still. point, that's point is Lord Agree will jump in. Allegedly. Poison the All Blacks. Susie, Susie in the kitchen will have uh, they're working up in BC this this week, feeding all the guys from LA some uh, 
fresh chicken. Fresh chicken. You know what I mean? All right, Pete, another great show, lot to digest. Week one was an absolute ripper. Enjoyed watching it. Looking forward to week two. Uh, any final thoughts? Any Anything you want to say to the beautiful people? No, no, I mean, you know, I appreciate uh, um, everyone, you know, watch, watching the games. You can get them all on the on the rugby network. They're all archived, even the uh, Fox game, which you may not be able to see live. So that's always a good one to go back and look at. And um, I'm really looking forward to like Thursday night, Friday night games because the timing's perfect. The kids are going to be asleep. You know, my wife's going to will be, you know, I'll be able to cast it, I think, up into up onto our Apple yeah. TV and, uh, you know, watch it. And Yvonne's going to be like, really? I'm just going to go. Cab Sav, huh? No. Uh, well, I see, I see how things are in the Steinberg house. Yeah, I like absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'll wrap it for the professor, Pete Steinberg, Aaron Castro, Ryan Ginty, our entire team at MLR Kickoff. I'm Dan Power. Thanks for tuning in.